Hey, I am Scott Stewart. I'm a kid's author, illustrator, and more than anything, I always wanted to have been a mountain climber. You know, I always, since when I was a child, I wanted to have climbed Mount Everest. I wanted to have climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. I wanted to have done the seven summits around the world. And then it wasn't that long ago that I realized that I wanted to have done all of those things in the past, I wanted to have already you know, battled through oxygen deprivation to reach the summit. I wanted to have already camped out you know, on a snowy mountainside, freezing cold. You know, I didn't actually really want to do them in the present. And there are so many things in my life that I wish I had done in the past. Like I really would love to have been a marathon runner or to have run a marathon. I don't really want to run one though. You know, I want to have skydived. I don't know if I necessarily want to jump out of a plane. Um, and for a very long time, I wanted to have been an author. I want you to have written books. But the idea of actually sitting down and working on a book, writing it, editing it, and in this case, you know, in my case, a lot of the time illustrating it, you know, I just didn't actually want to do that. You know, when I was eight years old, I was asked what I wanted to be. And my answer was either a professional athlete or an author. And for 22 years uh, from that point, I basically always wanted to have been an author. But then something took me from wanting to be an author to wanting to have written a book to actually wanting to write one. And for me, that was a Monday. It was a very specific Monday at around 10.30 a.m. Uh, and that was when my son was born. Uh, he was born in the morning. He was born a couple of weeks early. And so I was a freelance designer and I had a ton of work that I was planning to finish over those next two weeks to get done so that I could spend the first month or so really just chilling out with my son and my wife and really getting to know this new member of our family. Well, when he came two weeks early, suddenly I was stuck here and it was almost a good thing when I was kicked out of the hospital because visiting hours were over and I wasn't allowed to stay you know, overnight with my wife and my son and I had to go home and I arrived home and I thought this is not ideal, but it's kind of perfect in a way because I can get this you know, weeks of work done right now you know, and you know, I'll be able to just chill with my son. Well, like most great writers, I'm also fantastic at procrastination. And instead of doing all those design projects, this idea popped in my head that wouldn't it be great if my son could grow up knowing that there is a picture book out there or a book out there that was about him, that was written for him. And I just thought that would be so cool. So I put all the <laughs> design projects that I was supposed to be doing, I put them to the side and I had my little iPhone, like an iPhone three or four. And I wrote this entire book on this iPhone. I don't know why I didn't just get a pen and paper, but I wrote it on an iPhone anyway. And that first book became this one, A Pickle in the Post, uh, which is about a young boy with the name of my son uh, who really wanted to send a present to his grandfather for his granddad's birthday, but accidentally sent a pickle instead and had to chase the pickle through the postage system and have adventures and eventually arrive at his granddad's house. Now, it's a kind of silly idea. Um, and to be honest, it's not particularly well executed. It was my first book, um, but I absolutely 
loved writing it. And funnily enough, you know, I had this vision that, you know, this, the pickle was going to be the new cultural thing. This was going to take over Harry Potter. You know, I was very optimistic. I thought this thing is going to be New York Times bestseller. It's going to sell millions of copies. It's just absolutely brilliant. Uh, so I self-published it. I wasn't confident enough to illustrate my own book. Uh, so I, I hired an illustrator, Mahilo, a really fantastic illustrator, and he did all the illustrations. And you know, I got it self-published through Amazon. And I remember hitting that launch button and just thinking, man, today is going to change my life. I'm going to sell thousands of copies today. Uh, this is going to be the start of this cultural phenomenon. Well, in the first six months, I sold maybe seven copies <laughs> and I bought probably two of those. So it didn't quite go as well as I thought it would, but I just completely fell in love with the process of writing. And my wife and I were sitting down and she asked me, how I enjoyed it, if I was thinking about writing another one, and she was asking about potentially whether I'd write a sequel to that book. And I remember saying, you know what? I don't even really care that it didn't sell that well. Like I wish it had sold more, but I just had so much fun writing this book and creating this world and kind of doing it with this reason in mind, you know, that I was writing it for my son. And so I said, I'm, I really want to keep doing this. I want to keep writing. And basically from that moment forward for the last eight years, I have been writing every single day here. You know, I made a decision that if I was going to be a writer, then I'd better write. And so every day I write, whether it's terrible writing, which most of the time it is, or every now and then it's okay writing and very rarely not too rarely, fortunately, it turns out to be pretty good writing and they're the ones that I turn into books. Um, but coming up with ideas for books, you know, I always thought this would be a bit of a challenge and that the lightning would strike you and you had to, you know, have the muse and all those sorts of things. But I started just pulling inspiration from my life and the struggles I was going through, especially with my son the emotions we were feeling, the things that he was feeling. And this kind of all culminated in this one moment where when, around, when, when he was around four years old, he fell completely, completely head over heels in love with Queen Elsa from the Frozen movies. And he had the costumes and he had the dresses and he had all the merchandise and he completely loved Queen Elsa. And he had this Elsa water bottle that he would take everywhere he went. Uh, he would stop people in the street and he would show it to them. He was so proud of this Elsa water bottle. So he took it to daycare, childcare one day. And that afternoon when I went to pick him up, he was sobbing. He was completely distraught. Uh, somebody there, and I don't think it was a student, I think it was actually one of the educators. Somebody there had said to him that Elsa was only for girls and that because he was a boy, he wasn't allowed to like her. And he was completely upset because you know, for him, Elsa was everything. And so you know, we kind of handled that situation, but that night, I was lying in bed and I thought, you know, I need to get some books. I need to find some books that represent him, a young boy who likes things that you know, we've culturally deemed you know, feminine. And so I jumped online, again on my iPhone, perhaps a little bit better iPhone, maybe an iPhone 5 or something. And I started looking for books that represented my son. And I found two or three of them. And one of them, the entire message was, if you're different from society, change yourself so people like you. They weren't particularly good. 
So I decided that I needed to start writing books that represented my son, represented other kids who don't see themselves in media. And so that night, you know, through the middle of the night, on my little iPhone again, I tapped out the first draft of this book, My Shadow is Pink, which has you know, so far been my most successful book, being translated into a whole bunch of languages and going into a whole bunch of countries and you know being in discussion for TV and movie show deals and all those sorts of things. Um, but getting to that point was really, really challenging. One of the things that I often say is that this book took me four years to write and it's only like 500 words. And so unlike a novel, where you're sitting at the computer actually writing for you know four years this was four years of struggling through decisions decisions of what i was going to put into this story decisions of what i was going to leave out because i felt this potentially unfair weight of responsibility on me that if i was going to produce this story and put this story into the world, it needed to be something that one, accurately represented a young boy who was breaking gender stereotypes, two, it needed to accurately represent some of the things that family and friends and culture experience when that boy is breaking gender stereotypes, but it also needed to be kind. It needed to be empowering and affirming and it shouldn't you know, strike fear into a child's heart about potentially breaking those stereotypes because that's often one of the things that I see with my son is that when he's watching a movie or reading a book and it's got that hero's journey, which I completely believe in, but it's got that hero's journey where the, the, uh, the, the protagonist you know, wants to do something, wants to be themselves, and then they suffer an inordinate amount of bullying, you know, and then they need to work through that. Just the thought of having to go through that stage of bullying is really off-putting and terrifying you know, to a child. So I didn't want to have that as part of this book. I didn't want to have any bullying. I didn't want the child to go through anything specifically outwardly you know, negative. I wanted all the experiences, all the struggles to be mostly internal and within his family. And you know, so it took me a really long time to figure out exactly how to approach that. My first draft was basically a rejection of his shadow. He was, it was actually called My Shadow Is Not Pink. It wasn't called My Shadow Is Pink. It was called My Shadow Is Not Pink because he was trying to reject the fact that his shadow was pink and he wished it was something else. He wished it was blue like all of his friends and his brothers and his dad. Um, and ultimately, it went through that stage of finally accepting it. But even just that whole rejection piece, you know, I struggled to make work. And that's something that you, know, as an author, is possibly my horcrux, you know, my kryptonite, um, is actually getting a story distilled down to one theme, and one concept. And as soon as I do that, the writing becomes easy and fun and fantastic. But until I do that, it's a real struggle. One of the uh, stories that I'm working on right now is a longer story. It's a middle fiction story. And I have been working on this story for close to three years. And I, I haven't even started actually writing it. I've been plotting it, just doing the outline, because uh, I am a planner most of the time when it comes to books. Uh, sometimes I just write, but most of the time I'm a planner. And with this book, I've been struggling so much because I will start the outline and I'll hit a point and it just kind of, there's nowhere to go, you know, or I'll write the entire outline. It's just not working, you know, and I've been doing this over and over and over again on this story and not, you know, two weeks ago. I was taking my dog for her morning walk and uh, I was walking along and I just thought, you know what, I'm so tired of working on this story. What is this story actually about? What's the one thing this story is about? 
And I distilled the entire story down to just one sentence. And I went back and in an hour, I had a whole outline, plot points, scenes, all mapped out, super easy, working brilliantly. And I was just going frustratingly, you know, it was just so frustratingly easy, you know, and that's what the process with My Shadow is Pink was. It was years of trying to add so many things into this story. You know, I wanted the story to have a boy in a dress, but then I also wanted it to be, you know, the pink shadow. And I, for some reason, I didn't think those could coexist. I wanted uh, the boy to suffer, you know, uh, negativity, but I didn't want any negativity suffered. And I was, I was really struggling. I was getting really tied up in knots. And so eventually I was driving and I was stuck in roadworks on my way to work. And I just asked myself the question, you know, what is the one thing this story is about? And why am I the only person who can write that? And I thought this book is just about a young boy who is breaking a gender stereotype and needs to learn to accept himself. And so once I had that, I could wrap it within the container of being the thing that I can write it out because I have that experience. I have a son who loved Elsa and Anna and all things, you know, princesses. And the way that we resolved that was we dressed up together when he wanted to go to the Frozen 2 movie premiere. Uh, dressed as Elsa, you know, El in the Elsa costume, he was a little bit afraid that people might laugh at him. So I dressed up with him and I just thought, you know what? I can write about this. I can talk about every emotion that I felt. I can talk about every emotion that he felt. I can get this into a book. So I wrote it and that was it. Again, it was like once I distilled it down, it just became so, so easy. And then I had to find a publisher and <sighs> that was tough. I didn't have an agent at the time um, and I started submitting, you know, cold submissions to publishers and I was getting rejections left and right. Um, you know, I was even getting some feedback on the story as well, you know, and almost all of that was, you know, no parent wants to read their kid, you know, a story about a boy in a dress, you know, at three years old, you know, and there was so much feedback around, you know, it's a fantastic topic, but for later in life, you know, once they're a teenager or once they're, you know, eight, nine, ten in a junior fiction, you know, we don't want to tackle this in a picture book. And, uh, but I felt just so incredibly strongly that that was not the case. I still feel that, you know, the, the media that we expose our young kids to start shaping how they view the world. You know, I believe that if we don't give them a really diverse representation of society as a whole, you know, they grow up with a really narrowly defined viewpoint. Um, and especially around things like gender, sexuality, you know, things that they may actually, you know, feel inside themselves, but they're being brought up in this really narrow view, you know, everything outside of that can just create shame for them, you know. So I knew that this was a really important topic to have in a picture book for young kids to break that stigma really, really early. Um, and as part of that, I knew that there are phases in storytelling. I knew that there's kind of the breaking of the stereotype phase, you know, which this book does. You know, it talks about the stereotype that exists, that you know, boys need to be manly and not like things that are feminine, you know, um, and then actively break that. And then at some point in the future, we can just have books that are simply just pure representation. You know, there's a character in the book who's a boy who wears a dress or there's a boy who does makeup and it's, there's no story about it. You know, it just happens to be a character and inclusion. Um, but, you know, that stereotype needed to be broken first. So I knew this was important. And, you know, so I was really struggling, getting tons of rejections. And then through this really 
pure serendipity, I was put in contact with the team at Larrikin House. Uh, we had met really briefly at one of their readings, which I had turned up to accidentally with my son. I didn't even know it was on. Um, and then, you know, uh, I posted uh, on Facebook, on a Facebook group, a children's book group, just an illustration that I had done. And Mary from Larrikin reached out to me and said, you know, can you send me some more illustrations? I would love to you know, have a chat about you potentially illustrating one of our books. And I said, that's great. Can I actually send you a manuscript instead? And you know, she said, sure. And later on, I discovered she said, sure, as though, you know, sure, send me the manuscript. It's going to be terrible. You know, and then we can get back to talking about the illustrations. I sent her the manuscript and within an hour, they had come back to me wanting the manuscript. And by this stage, I was really fortunate to already have another book in the works with another publisher. You know, I already had an agent and the book that was already you know, in the works was How to Be a Real Man, uh, t titled again, something completely different. You know, so everything just kind of fell into place and the team at Larrikin were absolutely amazing that they wanted to really hold on to the soul of the story. They requested very few changes um, and yeah, it finally hit the shelf. <laughs> and since it's hit the shelves, I've learned a couple of things. One, representation is unbelievably important, especially in kids' books. You know, they are not seeing themselves represented. Your know, books are portraying a really narrow view of society, and there's so much outside of that, and so much, so many kids who want to see themselves represented. Two, as an author, you know, I have the ability to actually impact these kids' lives. You know, I know when I was a kid, your know, books were such a huge part of my world. They shaped me and gave me so many of my belief systems that I still hold. You know, so having the ability to impact that is incredible. M3 is a lesson that I had been taught a long time ago, but I didn't really fully understand it until you know, had this book on the shelves. And that is in the specific lies the universal. So this is a very specific story about a young boy breaking a gender stereotype. Um, and I've done it in a way that creates some conversation by using shadow as a metaphor for the, for our internal selves. And I've had so many people reaching out to me with very different stories very, very different stories of their kids being very different from a young boy who wants to wear a dress. Maybe their child was is bisexual. Maybe their child is gender non-binary. Maybe their child is a young boy who likes things that are more feminine. You know, maybe they have a daughter you know, who is a bit more of a you know, what we'd call tomboy. And this story has given them the space to actually have those conversations. So in the specific lies the universal. So that's one thing that I have definitely learned to tell my specific stories as an author with the impact of that I want to make in the world and it can actually happen. So that's it. That's me or part of me, I guess. I still haven't climbed any mountains, uh, but I am writing books and hopefully uh, we might get to meet actually in person one day. Uh, thank you and see you soon.